In recent decades, millions of people have drifted away from Jesus and their Catholic faith. Sadly, many may never find their way back. I'm Tom Peterson, and I believe that God has called me to use my background in media to be a catalyst in the new evangelization. Our organization produces inspiring and creative evangelization messages that have helped lead hundreds of thousands of inactive Catholics, converts, agnostics, and atheists home to Jesus and His Holy Church. Join us as we travel across North America to bring you stories of heartbreak, redemption, and transformation as the Holy Spirit leads His people home. God has an extraordinary plan for each of our lives. He wants us to spend eternity in heaven with Him and bring as many people with us as possible. This is Catholics Come Home. Now, I welcome you to my home to hear their amazing stories. Welcome to Catholics Come Home. In this episode, we'll meet a 50-year-old self-proclaimed Connecticut Yankee who now works as a consultant in Alabama. For many years, this man operated in what he calls a spiritual wilderness, serving on the teams of a highly liberal president and other left-wing politicians who vigorously endorsed abortion. One day, our guest admitted that he could no longer face himself in the mirror any longer and relinquished his career in liberal politics. He reconnected with his Catholic roots and now lives true to his pro-life heart. Like everybody else in this series, today's guest came home to the church by responding to a call of the Holy Spirit. I'd like you to meet Joe O'Farrell. Joe, welcome home to the Catholic Church and welcome to our home. Thanks, Tom. It's great to see you again. I'm excited about this interview because I know your story and I know that the viewers are going to love it. But let's go back a few years and start with your childhood. Tell, tell us about where you grew up, what your parents did for a living, how many kids were in the family, and what religious background you had. Sure, Tom. We were very Catholic. So Good. we grew up in a little town called Niantic, Connecticut. It's on the southeastern shore. Wow. The whole area it was um, uh, military, Navy. My dad was an engineer. My oh. mom was a nurse. It was a great place to grow up and a great Catholic parish. I went to a uh, little school in Niantic, but then in high school, I went to St. Bernard's. So that was my introduction to Catholic education. Wonderful. Any brothers or sisters? I have two sisters and one brother. Great. So I fit uh, squarely in the middle. Good for you. <laughs> And how was it growing up? Were you guys extremely Catholic? Did you go to Mass every Sunday? Have any particular devotions you remember? Yeah, a wonderful uh, Catholic upbringing. Uh, devout parents, uh, Mass every Sunday, very involved in the church. My dad was president of the parish council, involved in the Knights of Columbus. Great. And my mom was uh, you know, leader of every prayer group. So they were part of the charismatic movement early oh, on. So wow. I got uh, used to that and that was very nice and pretty active. Um, at the time. Did you go with them to prayer meetings and things? Yes, yes, sure did. That's wonderful. Yeah, I have that same background from my youth. So it's, uh, it's awesome. And that was the early days of the charismatic movement. Yeah, when um, one significant event was when we traveled um, in uh, 1976 down to Philadelphia for the uh, Eucharistic Congress, the Charismatic Convention. Wow. And um, what uh, many people didn't know at the time was that uh, Carol Wotilla, who was a cardinal, was there. Oh. And so was Mother Teresa. Oh my goodness. So one of my earliest memories was uh, sitting in the uh, convocation center there in Philadelphia. And this little blue and white dot was there um, at the, uh, the podium giving an amazing talk. Oh, and we were little. So afterwards, my very Catholic mother looked at us all and said, don't say a word. And she walked us down to the stage after people had cleared out. And we stood on the stage and she took the glass of water and the pitcher that Mother Teresa had drank from and she handed us each uh, a drink from the glass. Wow. And, uh, I would have put it in my pocket, but she Talk about holy yeah, water, so huh? <laughs> we got the holy water there. So wonderful parents. My dad's passed on now, but my mom is still doing wonderful things up in Boston for the pro-life movement and working hard Praise every day. Praise God. Yeah. Well, I thank God that your parents were so devout and they planted those seeds and brought you to events like that to really uh, start a firm foundation in your life. So as you grew up and you were at St. Bernard's, was it? St. Bernard's, yeah, For yes. high school. Where was your faith the strongest and when did it start kind of waning a little bit, if, if at all? It was a great Catholic school experience, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't enough 
really to solidify things. And so, like many people, um, I, was in, I was involved in the faith. We went, we went to church on Sunday, but it was more when I uh, left for college that uh, things changed a little bit. And so that was, I think, typical of a lot of Catholics. You think? Where, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, God never let me go. Right. Right. So I moved away, away from him. Uh, Where did you go to college? A small school in New England uh, okay. called Bradford, a uh, okay. very liberal arts school. And typical college activities that lured you away from God? or? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the party scene and all yeah. that. There was a, a church uh, down the road and mm -hmm. that I wasn't attending on Sundays. Yeah. But um, as, as I said, God never left me right. behind. I, I really just wandered as people do. But I've seen now how he acted in my life throughout oh, all yeah. of it. In hindsight, it's 2020, isn't it? Yes. Yep. So the process was, you know, just knowing God was there and, um, and kind of ebbing and flowing closer to Him. You know, when I left school, uh, I took a trip to Europe oh. after I graduated and really, you know, just, just looked at different things and looked at things from a different side. Did you visit any of the cathedrals? Was that part of your trip or was it all just the secular fun? You know, that's interesting because I, I felt the Catholicism of old Europe. And I was in uh, Belgium and Italy, wow. in the north of Italy. And um, there was one opportunity I had to visit a small chapel deserted on the top mm. of a mountain outside of Parma. Wow. And, um, you know, it, it felt like, like me, like there was something there, but it was this empty church and yeah. the wind was blowing through the windows. And I, I thought about that often uh, mm -hmm. since then, where, where God, God was there and always available to me. So, you know, as time went on, I found my way back. Um, through you know, different circumstances. In just a minute, you will learn what helped draw Joe closer to Jesus. So sitting there asking myself these questions and feeling God, I just was like, I'm, I'm miserable, right? This is not making me happy. The world told me this would make me happy and it wasn't. How do you figure out what is right and what is wrong? Well, if your core beliefs are shaped by your culture or the world that is always changing, then you are probably on this road. But if your beliefs are based on truth that never changes, then you are likely over here. So which is right? Well, moral relativism means you can kind of make up your morality as you go. If you decide you want to change what's right and wrong, moral relativism says that's okay. Yet those over here say that there is one truth that never changes. Here you always know what is right and wrong. John Paul II warned us at the end of this road we will find the culture of death. Those who are on this road believe that God would not create humanity and then stop short of telling his children exactly what is right and what is wrong. It is because of this that we believe that at the end of this road, we will truly find the fullness of life. Joe, after your tumultuous partying college years and after your trip to Europe where God was trying to get your attention at that Italian church you were in with the wind blowing and all, did you come right back to church or did your life kind of take a different turn? Yeah, it was a little bit of a winding path, Tom. I um, moved to Atlanta huh? after my return to the States just really to turn over a new leaf. My sister was down there um, and, you know, I wanted to try something new. Sure. I was excited about an opportunity with the Olympic Games. Oh. So um, wow. I went to uh, down there ahead of the Olympics in mm -hmm. 1996 and I was able to uh, get a job with the Olympics, which was just really interesting. That's fun for a young man. It, it was awesome. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, it, it led me to um, some neat opportunities, which kind of defined the path that I took. So I made good Catholic friends and I was involved in Life Teen. Oh, good. But uh, during the time that I was at the Olympics, I was offered the opportunity as an Olympic staffer to help coordinate the visit of the vice president. So he huh? came in about a month before the games to open the Olympic Stadium, okay. which is now uh, Turner Field. And so uh, that was a, a big thing, right? Yeah. And uh, although uh, very much a Republican, this opportunity got my attention. Um, and the trip went very well. So you were a Republican, but was the vice president a Democrat at the time? Yeah, that was, that was Al Gore at, oh, okay. uh, in 96. And so what happened was this opportunity through the Olympics to help uh, the White House coordinate the trip 
wow. uh, kind of introduced me to a number of people from the campaign. Well, it's an honor they chose you as a young man to do that. That's a responsibility. Yeah, the Olympics was a great opportunity sure. for me to kind of learn uh, what I could handle, yeah. and it, it was a neat thing. And so this opportunity with the vice president allowed me to uh, um, you know, perform in a way that the campaign noticed and this, the White House noticed. And so when the Olympics were over, we were all done. And a few of the folks from uh, the, the vice president's staff invited me to join the campaign. Wow. So the games finished in the first part of August um, in 96. And so I stayed with the Gore half of the Clinton-Gore campaign and really had a nice opportunity to be introduced to things I, I never thought I would get to. And so it was, uh, it was full speed ahead into the campaign. And then... Um, Were you living in Atlanta or did you eventually end up in D.C.? You know, I always stayed in Atlanta. Okay. Uh, and it was an interesting path because we they won uh, the election in 96. And one of the, uh, the folks who was uh, a good Catholic guy who worked um, with the vice president gave me some advice to stay down in Atlanta. Okay. Um, and then I coordinated the visits of the president or the vice president to the southeast U.S. for a number of years. So I was... Uh, a volunteer, but uh, sort of on the board in the White House, so that I would send me out with the advance teams and I'd coordinate these events. And so what I did was uh, started a little uh, company where I did local events huh. and the aftermath of the Olympics, there was a lot of that going on, worked with Coca-Cola. And so these opportunities would come up, I would just wait by the phone and yeah. then uh, go on an exciting trip. Yeah, for a young trip. person, it was like a pretty big deal you were doing these things. It was, it was pretty heady stuff. And working my faith the whole time, I, I struggled, right? And that I little... was gonna ask you that, because like, you're trying to balance coming back to the church and getting involved in Life Teen, and yet you're kind of working with some folks that I would assume part of the platform is not very faith-centered. Yeah, and I, you know, Tom, the thing that I would do is I would take those round keep abortion legal signs at the yeah. rallies that I would coordinate and I would stuff them under a table and kind of pretend that was courageous. Oh. And, you know, so the, these struggles were pretty close. But so you're already having kind of a challenge of conscience where you were trying to do the right thing, but yet you were serving some folks who were diametrically opposed to your Catholic roots. Yeah, and I, I would yeah. say one of the things that I experienced that I just, I don't think is there anymore is that we would fly into a city to do an event yeah. uh, for the president, the vice president, and somebody on the advanced staff would ask me, where are we going to church on Sunday? Wow. And I just don't know if that's there anymore. Yeah. And so at, at that time, there were a lot of, you know, uh, children of Kennedy Catholics and people that hmm. were culturally Catholic that was still part. They made an effort. Yeah, and yeah. I don't know, as Today, I said, if it's there. Not as much, if, if at all. Right. Yeah. So tell us more. I think you had a situation in California that was a bit of an epiphany in your faith, uh, kind of on a life issues uh, topic, right? It was, Tom. <clears throat> so I stayed involved with politics for two years. I ended up uh, doing this work uh, with the vice president and then joined a campaign for uh, the governor of Georgia and so got him elected and served on his staff. And um, during this time, I was always called up to do these events. And then during the uh, election in 2000, I joined the, the Gore Lieberman ticket as a full-time uh, employee with the campaign. And so we traveled in 2000 out to California. And that was the Democratic National Convention that year in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a time where I was, you know, I'd moved up uh, the, the ladder a little bit. and really expected to be in the West Wing with the next president if Gore had won. And so the whole time I was, you know, asking these questions in my heart, what am I doing? This great opportunity was there, but God was still working on me. And during that visit, we were at a party in uh, the hills of, uh, of Los Angeles, and the event was titled uh, Hollywood Salutes President Clinton. And so there I was entering, I walked in with the President of the United States. And so it's one of those things where you want to call your friends and say, hey, look at me. All the stars that I had grown up with, uh, you know, from movie and TV were walking around at this party. Cher was singing on stage and I was standing 10 feet away from, from Bill Clinton. And I thought, wow, okay, this is the world. And I'm kind of rolling this around in my hand. And this is what everybody says you should, you should seek, power and fame. And, um, when we had come in with the motorcade, Tom, down at the bottom of the driveway of this home where they held the party, there were a um, small group of pro-life protesters. Good for them. Yeah. And so, yeah, good for them, because what they, 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 uh, they reminded me in a way that uh, yeah. when I saw them as we pulled in, I kind of winced and thought, you know, wow. Um, 
down deep you felt conflicted because your parents had raised you to be pro-life. You were a pro-life Republican before you started serving yes. at the Olympics and ended up getting on the Democratic platforms and, and serving there. And you felt very conflicted at this point. It, it was, and it, it was God who, uh, who, who never left me yeah. and reminded me at that time. In, in, the, in the few minutes we have left for this yeah. segment, Joe, tell us you know, exactly what happened. How, how did God touch your heart and what changed in you? Oh, it was profound and there was, there was no, uh, no getting around it. So sitting there asking myself these questions and feeling God, I just was like, I'm, I'm miserable, right? This is yeah. not making me happy. The world told me this would make me happy and it wasn't. So the president left um, with the motorcade and the entourage and we stayed behind. Um, and as we left in our van, uh, with some other staffers from the campaign, we drove by this group, mm. um, and they had the the graphic signs that uh, mm. you know that that, that do uh, affect people. And sure. so, as I was looking at them, uh, this young woman amidst that group that I hadn't seen before was smiling at me, and I looked out the window and with with love, with love, with yeah. with such yeah, a beautiful. For all you guys, I'm sure. And so, yeah, and yeah. Uh, she was an angel, and so. Yeah. Literally, I, I looked at her smiling at me and heard in my head, what are you doing over there, Joe? Yeah. You belong with us. Yeah. And so that was the moment where God kind of... Uh, Praise God me. he did. Praise <laughs> God he did. And, you know, I'll never forget it. And I'll never forget mm. that, that, that smiling. I think she was an angel for yeah. me that just said, Joe, this How is where you belong. How about devout Christian? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. the way I heard it yeah. was, was, the, was the touch from God. Yeah. And so I, I wish I had the courage to say that I just left for home and left the campaign behind, but I sort of felt like I was on this speeding train that was going to crash. And I dedicated my life for four years to, uh, you know, achieving this worldly goal. But I was, I was never in it. Uh, again, God had my heart. I never voted for yeah. Mr. Gore. Yeah. And that was a tumultuous end. And I remember yeah. uh, election night in Nashville. We. Um, we drove home that next day after after all the uncertainty, and uh, I drove right to one of my favorite places in the world, which is the Blessed Sacrament Chapel mm. at the Cathedral of Christ the King. Nice. So that was my home for many, many years, you, and a place. You, you paid that, a visit and changed you. Yeah, I dropped my nets, and, and I just said, "What? What now, God?" You had said one thing to me, Joe, and I know you're kind of tearing up a little bit now, thinking about how God changed your heart. You said, "I could not face myself in the mirror any longer." It was, it was one of those things where um, you know who you are. God made you to be someone. And, um, you know, I talked with him about it. I was like, what is all this opportunity, you know? Yeah. And, and these things that I never thought that would be in my life. And yet God was with me the whole way. And, you know, I, I look back and I think, okay, I, I learned some things. And I'm involved in politics now. And learning inside the belly of that beast has, has served me as I serve others. And so I, I can see the wisdom of the Lord yeah. in it, but it was, it was a, a profound moment in my life and um, I, I'm grateful for it. I'm thinking of that scripture phrase, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? In the world sense, you had made it. You were up near the top with all the celebrities and everything, but you knew in your heart that wasn't who God created you to be. You couldn't deny the fact that you were living a lie. Right, and it was, it was you could feel that, I, I could feel that I was yeah. against uh, the nature of, of, of yeah. what God put in me. And so since then, I've had the wonderful opportunity to serve him and serve the church and uh, raise a, a beautiful family. Uh, my wife, Kirsty, and I have, uh, have five wonderful children. Praise and uh, I continue to serve the church and serve him. And I know your story, so I'll mention that your first child is adopted. Yes, Maggie. And so. that, I imagine, was for, uh, I think you told me, you weren't really able to have kids and you adopted one, right? Yeah, so uh, another great blessing. We love adoption, yep. the best thing we ever Praise did. God for that. I'm, I, uh, Virtue Media is our other apostolate, yes. a pro-life apostolate, so we're big proponents of uh, uh, not only a sanctity of life, but adoption. But then God blessed you with four more that you and your wife were able to have natural born children, right? Absolutely, yeah. So Isn't about, God uh, good? <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful. So uh, we, we have uh, five, five kids and they're growing up great and uh, uh, God is good. All the time. All the time. Next, you'll hear about Joe's life today. The blessings to me right now are being able to raise a, a family in the church, to be able to serve the church. Each person has dignity and worth, not because of his physical abilities or occupation, not because of her skin color or status, 
Each person is valuable, not because of his productivity or age, but because we are human, created by God in his own image and likeness. And neither economics nor emotions should alter the length of each person's gift to humanity. Joe, we praise God that he touched your heart and you had your heart open to listen to God and you came home to him and changed, uh, changed out of that career that was not part of God's plan for your life, that you came home to your pro-life roots uh, and that you uh, were open to life in your own family and in your marriage. Uh, tell us now in this last uh, section of our interview how God uh, has, uh, how he enriches your faith, what inspires you to go deeper in faith how he blesses your family, any devotions you have to saints or the rosary or adoration. What feeds your faith now, Joe? Well, I would say uh, when I left, left all that behind, the, the great the great blessing uh, was uh, meeting my wife, Kirsty, who is wonderful um, and devout and uh, she's a convert. Uh -huh. And so the faith is our, is our life. Yes. And so while I was uh, working uh, at Earthlink the number of years after the campaigning, I gave, you know, I told the story I just mm -hmm. told you, and I spoke to a lot of people about it, oh, and I nice. felt, uh, but most of the time I'm doing this this job, you know, in the technology industry, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm an advocate on the outside, so I'm speaking, I'm getting involved Good. in pro-life things, and then I eventually found, uh, you know, it, it shaped my future career, and that, that Blessed Sacrament Chapel at Christ the King became a special place. Um, and uh, God rest his soul, Archbishop John Donahue. Oh, I love that um, man. He built it here in this diocese. What a good shepherd. What a he, he, he attracted me to move to Atlanta, yeah. and uh, what a kind soul. Yes. God rest so his soul. So those blessed sacrament chapels are all over this, this diocese. Yes. And so it became kind of the, the core. So spending that time with the Lord really led to that, leading me out of a career in, uh, in politics and technology, and then really just to ministry for the church. And so it brought me to Birmingham where I served the EWTN yes, for many years in, in yep. development. Yes. Um, and so that, that was a great blessing. And I, I loved that work. And um, after about uh, four and a half years, I left and started my own business. Okay. So now I have a consulting company that serves Catholic entities and pro-life groups. Beautiful, praise God. Yeah. Joe, I'm gonna ask you as we come to an end of our interview, and it seems to have gone fast. I'd like to hear more yeah. about your story and perhaps we can. Yeah. But uh, I'd like you to tell our viewers and tell me, when you look back at those days, I mean, you look back at your roots, your parents raised you in a devout Catholic home and taught you about pro-life, even brought you to meet, you know, Pope John Paul II and Mother Teresa as a kid. You know, what do you know now that you didn't know back then? Well, God never leaves you. Yeah. And I, I could feel and I could see it now. And it's almost like we're talking to each other here. He's just like, I was right it's over a personal your relationship with Jesus, isn't it? Personal relationship. Yeah. And so, you know, it wasn't always rosy after that. I left, left behind, you know, a, a lot. And I took, took this path and it's had its ups and downs. But um, the, the blessings to me right now are being able to raise a, a family in the church, to yes. be able to serve the church. And look at yourself in the mirror when you, when, when you do that every morning and say, I'm doing God's will now. Yeah, and I feel I feel connected, and so even with uh, some of the difficulties the church is going through, I feel like my service as a layman is is important, and I'm able to to listen to Christ and, and serve Him in these wonderful ways. And so when I have time, you know, to be with my kids and I, I show them our faith and I see them appreciate it and try and raise them uh, in in the the fullness of the faith, that that's God blessing me and continuing to, to sure bless is. what we do. You've mentioned you had to make a sacrifice. You had to give up those friends in the who were thinking the worldly ways. You had to give up some of the glamour, the money, and the political capital you had. But you can't outgive God. Your life is so much richer now. You're so much more blessed. And I think that's what your testimony tells me. I thank you for sharing it with me and with our viewers today. Joe, welcome home. Thank you, Tom. Let's talk about transformational habits for our spiritual lives. Specifically, I want to consider the power of silence for our spiritual growth. If you're more of a doer than a beer, this is me big time, being silent can be really hard. I started reading The Power of Silence by Cardinal Sarah some years ago. It's a wonderful book, which I highly recommend, or at least I definitely recommend the first half because sometimes even reading about silence takes time and is a struggle for me. 
I don't think it's a mistake that many of us are bent toward the more active life rather than the contemplative one, as most of our vocations probably lend toward that more naturally. But our active life is really dependent upon, really fruitful because of a rich contemplative life. Sometimes we don't even know the riches God has in store for us in the contemplative life until we just let him have his way with us. St. Therese of Lisieux wanted to be a great missionary, and she became one of the greatest contemplatives we have in the church. She let God have his way with her and look at the transformational benefit to her own spiritual life and consequently to ours. St. Catherine of Siena had the opposite experience. Catherine lived three years of almost unbroken solitude before God asked her to leave that solitary life and go out to the world. She was literally afraid that she would lose her contemplative spirit. God encouraged Catherine by telling her she would grow in love for him by growing in love for her neighbor. So we need both. That contemplative silence helps make our active lives fruitful, full of charity and good works, and our active life will hopefully draw us to that nourishment and rest we can only find through quiet contemplation. Chances are your soul is craving more silence than you might be giving it. We'll talk more about practicing silence in the next segments. Here's your opportunity to grow in faith and help Jesus save souls. Visit our CatholicsComeHome.org website and click on the Shop tab. Here, you can discover our four brand new popular books to help you and those you love grow closer to Christ. The Willpower Advantage. Building Habits for Lasting Happiness includes a personal spiritual audit and a customized plan to help you fight lifelong vices and find freedom in Christ. One Moment Can Change a Soul helps you guide family and friends home to the Catholic faith. Plus, two beautifully illustrated children's books to help your children or grandchildren stay close to Jesus. Epic, The Story of Jesus' Holy Catholic Church and Santa's Priority, keeping Christ in Christmas. You can also order a car magnet to evangelize in traffic, evangelization cards, and DVDs with all of our best episodes of our international television series. If you have a question or want to tell us how Catholics Come Home has blessed someone you know, or you can financially help us blitz the secular airwaves with these powerful evangelicals, contact us at info at catholicscomehome.org or by mail. Catholics Come Home, P.O. Box 1802, Roswell, Georgia, 30077. Please help Jesus save more souls. While Joe was at the peak of his career as a political consultant on the team of presidential candidates, his pro-life heart could no longer ignore the truth, nor could he support political bosses who promoted the killing of innocent babies through abortion. Through God's grace and an encounter with a pro-life prayer warrior, Joe relinquished his misguided career and began a new vocation where he, his wife of 17 years, and five children are centered on Christ and the sanctity of human life. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Catholics Come Home. Please keep Joe and the O'Farrell family and all of us at Catholics Come Home in your prayers. Remember to fulfill your role in the new evangelization and help love somebody to heaven. I 